Hello, my dear friends. Today, we are going to learn the story of Obersturmfuhrer Ezeke, adjutant of the 1st Battalion of the Panzer Regiment Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, how they were preparing for the storming of Kharkov in early March 1943. In his memoirs, he describes in great detail the hard tank battles, which clearly demonstrate the technical superiority of the Tiger tank. Well, now let's begin. Our battle group was on the left flank of the division. It was the first time we had a company of Tigers to back us up. Not long before moving to the line of departure, the commander led to me a war correspondent named Fernow. Take him with you to the tank. He wants to participate in the attack. But where do I place him? After training with the crew, we realized that the ideal place was below, to the side of the cannon. We moved forward under the cover of concentrated artillery fire. The breakthrough was successful. Due to the deep snow, the infantry of both companies had to get on the tanks. The light armored vehicles of the reconnaissance battalion could hardly keep up with us. The amphibians had to be towed. Sturmbannführer Meyer commanded the attack being in the vehicle of Obersturmführer Beck, the commander of the 2nd Company of the Panzer Regiment. Sturmbannführer Wunsche moved to the center. The 3rd Company of the Panzer Regiment Leibstandarte advanced on the right flank, and the 1st Company of the Hauptsturmführer Jurgensen moved 500 meters behind. Two of the Tigers followed Sturmbannführer Wunsche. The rest were disabled mostly due to breakage of parts and mounts inside the tanks, causing several tank crewmen to be wounded. The sound of battle came from behind us and a bit to the left, from the positions of the 320th Infantry Division. We were marching in a wide formation through the snow-covered plain. The roofs of houses appeared to our right on the horizon. It was Snischkov Kut. During a short halt, Sturmbannführer Wunsche commanded the 1st Company to make a right turn attack the village from the east and join us. We were supposed to continue the offensive in the same direction. In front of the village, a bit to the left of it, there was a gentle slope on which flashes appeared from time to time. We continued our march. Our guest, Fernow, mentioned that the squeak in his headphones distracted him, and the tank felt a bit cramped, but the experience was breathtaking. In the meantime, we moved up to positions on the hilltop at a distance of two kilometers. From time to time, in front or to the side of us, the snow would blow upward and there would be a gurgling sound. There were still as many as 18 tanks, both of the Tigers were trailing behind us. The infantry remained sitting on the tanks, taking cover behind the turrets. Halt! On the hilltop and in front of it, a wide band of flashes flickered. Bloody hell! It seems that we came right into the line of anti-tank defenses. The commander ordered both companies, Hurry up! Speed up! Forward! Beck's tank stood on our left. What happened to Sturmbrunnfuhrer Meyer? The tank wasn't burning. I recognized some kind of movement behind it. The rapid fire of our tanks wouldn't leave no damage to the defenders of the heights. The closest to us tanks were 800 meters behind us. Two tanks were on fire to our left and right. There came a decisive moment when we needed our tanks badly, but none of the tanks moved from their position. Right before that, Jurgensen, the commander of the first company, radioed, Orion, to Mercury! he said with a rolling pronunciation of the letter R. The village is two kilometers from here. There is no resistance. The commander replied, Speed up! Then he immediately continued, Commander to all vehicles, follow my direction. As his adjutant and being fifty meters to the side and slightly behind the commander's tank, running through the snowstorm, I ordered the crew, Full speed! Keep up! I tensely watched through the observation slits. We had already moved forward 150 meters when I noticed that the commander's tank was heading towards the shed on our right so that the area could be quietly observed from behind it. In a split second, I realized that the battle was raging around us. There were flashes flickering alarmingly at distinctly visible heights. It seemed that near the shed, we had found a gap in the field of fire. Now the other tanks moved as well. Having moved into the hilltop, the commander overcame the last 100 meters to the shed. In 200 or 300 meters, I saw the houses. At once, a flash of gunfire gleamed in the window of the nearest house, and we got a hit. In the glare of the fire, I shouted, Reverse! It wasn't long before our vehicle got hit again. I shouted, Out of the vehicle! And we were on the snow beside the tank. The wires of our headphones were dangling around our necks. The scalding heat of the fire hit us. By instinct, we buried our heads in the snow. Then the six of us, fortunately Fernow was still with us, crawled away from the tank. Weirdly enough, the fire that had engulfed the tank immediately went out. The tank rolled back 20 meters away on one track. Later, we discovered that a T-34 was ambushed in a nearby house. Its first hit destroyed our drive wheel, 
and then we ran into a mine while backing up. We had no time for thinking. The frequent rifle shots made it clear that the enemy was still in his position. What about the other tanks? The sound of gunfire and explosions meant that the battle between the tanks and anti-tank guns was in full swing. We were unable to distinguish the commander's tank. Then, a Tiger approached us. We tried to draw the attention of its crew to the T-34, but we were not noticed, of course. The following actions made us alternately happy and upset. Mesmerized, we observed the battle to our left through half-closed eyelids, forgetting about the pain from burns. As the Tiger reached the top, we heard a rumble. There was a flash of light and shrapnel whizzed around us. Looking up, we saw a black square spot on the tiger turret, about one meter by one meter in size. At this moment, the 88 millimeter gun of the tank, like a pointing finger, turned towards the target. Flash! We got on our knees to look at what had happened. Inside the half-destroyed house, we could distinctly see a burning tank with its turret blown off. We all rushed to embrace each other joyfully. Then the situation unfolded at lightning speed, at least two dozen T-34s moved out of the ambush at the edge of the village. In the meantime, the second tiger of Unterstromfuhrer Wendorf approached. Near Schnieskov Kut, eight enemy tanks were hit. While moving through the village, our tanks destroyed four more vehicles, and the rest ran away towards the village of Valky. At the same time, Sturmbannfuhrer Wuncha commanded the tanks on the line of the anti-tank defense. After the battle, there were counted 56 anti-tank guns. Together with the commander of the reconnaissance battalion, Wuncha and I arranged the sweep in the village. After being treated medically, I returned to the line with my head bandaged. At 7.30 a.m. on March 8, 1943, our battle group prepared for a new offensive to the north. Obviously, we were eager to know how to get to the village of Sirkuni. According to the map, the area to the north of Kharkov was wooded and swampy. Well, it was a hell of a night. We crossed the route of the other advancing units pursuing the enemy and reached the forests and swamps between Tchaikovsky and Sirkuni. The reconnaissance battalion marched ahead. Sturmbannfuhrer Wuncha ordered, I will move forward with those tanks that are able to get through. You will bring together all the forces to pull out and bring back into line stuck in the swamp and hit vehicles. You know the mission. In case you forget, move in our tracks. We started the work, which lasted all night and remained forever in the memory of all its participants. The vehicles had to overcome the soggiest areas in the middle of the forest, covered with deep snow, one at a time. Many times they had to be dragged by a long cable with two tanks at once. We did not even assume that the sudden attack of the reconnaissance battalion with three PZ-4s, which Sturmbannfuhrer Wuncho was able to get through, was successful. The success of the battles that paved the way to Kharkov from the northeast was equally unexpected. There were about eight kilometers to the intersection on the highway kharkov chuguev which was crucial for the defense of Kharkov. Battles for Kharkov in March 1943 In the first days of March, we moved in the tank battle group towards Kharkov for counterattack. By the order of the division headquarters, our battle group had the mission to quickly move behind the advancing enemy from Valky through Orshani and Dergachi to the outskirts of Kharkov and cut the routes of retreat in the direction of kharkov Belgorod. This mission was our favorite. We marched forward at great speed. The resistance was feeble, and we overcame it easily with vigorous attacks. The first to move was the company on the PZ-4. Behind it were our Tigers. We were followed by the armored personnel carriers and armored vehicles of the reconnaissance battalion, which were supposed to rush forward as soon as we broke through a gap in the enemy's defenses. There was a village in front of us. It was quiet. The hatches were closed, and we communicated by radio. The distance to the village was only 600 meters, but not a single shot had been fired yet. Our PZ-4s deployed for the attack. As the first tanks approached the dark houses, the fireworks started. The head tank got a direct hit in the turret. Two or three other tanks started smoking. One vehicle spun on the spot with its track broken. In the meantime, the enemy was still out of sight. They were well hidden behind houses and fences. Emboldened by their first success, the Russians intensified their fire. And the light tanks of our head company stopped. They were shooting with maximum intensity but could not accurately pinpoint the positions of anti-tank guns and tanks. It could not continue like this. PZ-4 could not make it through here. An order was received over the radio. Withdraw from the battle. Gather in the gully. One company lost at once eight vehicles. Though the crews of three tanks were able to climb out, but the rest got direct hits. We changed the plan. 
Now, two of our Tigers were supposed to move ahead, and the other tanks were to follow us at some distance. The reconnaissance battalion vehicles had to wait in the gully for orders by radio. We drove out into the open terrain. When we saw the burning German tanks, we were overwhelmed with anxiety. The defenders immediately concentrated fire on us, but it was useless at this distance. The enemy was still out of sight. All of a sudden, three T-34s pulled away from the houses, probably trying to flank us. We quickly aimed the cannons at the target, turning the turrets to the left. We halted, and the first shells flew out of the gun barrels. The sound of the hit and the explosion came almost at the same time. The gunner had already targeted the next enemy tank. Fire! And the vehicle was literally blown to pieces. It seemed that the shell hit the fuel tank. The third enemy tank probably attempted to turn around. It turned to us with its stern and was immediately hit. It was only then that we began to notice the sound of shells hitting the armor. Those three T-34s distracted our attention. Apparently, an anti-tank gun was firing at us now from the village's low houses. One after another, we shelled the houses with fragmentation shells and had at least a respite for a while. We were going to approach the houses closer. Backing each other, we broke into the village on a wide road. The other tanks followed us at long intervals, and the armored personnel carriers of the reconnaissance battalion rushed to the outskirts of the village. The infantry disembarked and went forward, covering our tigers on the flanks. The enemy was being smoked out of the houses with hand grenades and machine gun fire. Now we realized from where we were being fired upon. The Russians had put 47mm anti-tank guns in the houses on the opposite side, which is why we couldn't see them. Our Tigers crossed a broad area and spot a few other T-34s attempting to leave the village unnoticed. In one fell swoop, two of our Tigers rapidly destroyed another eight tanks. Soon we realized why so many troops were accumulated in this village. A few hundred meters behind it, there was a bridge over which our tanks were supposed to cross the river. We pursued the enemy vigorously. Right in front of the bridge, we faced two enemy tanks. They were probably put to cover the preparations of the explosion of the bridge. It was their death sentence. Then we captured the crossing and reported via radio to the battle group commander. The PZ-4s moved to the other bank, and the infantry of the reconnaissance battalion swept the village. At night, we reached the Kharkov-Belgorod Highway and deprived the Russians surrounded in Kharkov of the chance for a breakthrough. However, it was still too early to think about rest. We were supposed to participate again in the counterattack on this city, which was the scene of a desperate fighting. We could not afford more than a few hours of sleep. We feverishly did the maintenance, changing the oil, tightening the tracks. After cleaning the ventilation system, we waited for the appointed hour. At night, we moved to the line of departure. At daybreak, we had a clear view of the target of the offensive. We could distinctly see the high-rise buildings of Red Square, through which we had passed just a few days or weeks before. Back then, we photographed the striking contrast between these buildings and the city slums, not neglecting to take pictures of each other as well. Probably the films were still undeveloped, remaining in the cameras. Many of our comrades, happily posing with Russian young women to remember Kharkov, were not alive anymore. That is all for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like and support the channel by subscribing. See you all later, and until next time.